Welcome to the first live episode of The Right Environment. And when we talk about right environment, you can't do better than this. We're coming to you live from the Writer's Store in Los Angeles, California. The writer we'll be speaking with today got his first break out in deep space. But after five years of honing his career working on a small space station with Ferengis, Klingons, shapeshifters, and even a few humans, he actually got to go where no writer had ever gone before. Working from notes left behind, he created an original science fiction series about a, space, about a spaceship out in space, a starship out in space with a crew on it from notes left over from Gene Roddenberry. Once again, we are live, and the writer we'll be speaking with today is Robert Hewitt Wolf. I'm Jeff Berman, and there's no doubt about it, but we've just entered the right environment. <laughs> Thank you for very much. This is Robert Hewitt Wolf. Thank you for being with us. I appreciate you taking the time today. When it comes to environment, we talk about environment a lot for writers, the opportunity to go into their offices, their homes, Starbucks, wherever it is that they write. It's always interesting to see how unique it is. And this is great. I can't come into a store like this. It's like it's like candy for me, yeah, without getting right. out, without buying something. But what kind of environment do you actually like to write in? I can write anywhere if I need to. I, I, Right now, I'm working at home. Mm -hmm. um, I'm freelancing, so I tend to actually write in the dining room because it has the most light in the house. Uh, I use I work right on a laptop. Uh, it's it's more of a luggable. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a desktop replacement. So uh, so I can put it anywhere in the house. But generally, I, I sit where the best light and the best view is in the room. And I you don't I find write. distractions from people walking in and out of the room. Uh, well, I mean, it's just my wife and I, and my dog. So right. and and. Uh, you know, yeah, there's always distractions. There's always going to be distractions at home and stuff like that. But any, I'm used to being on shows, too. And when you're on a show, you're constantly multitasking. So you write as much as you can. And then there's always someone coming in with a prop or a problem or you're right. getting a phone call from the network or whatever. So you're constantly dealing with that. So especially in television, you really have to learn to just write when you have the moment to write. It's, it's kind of like, um, you know, you always talk to guys in the military and they – they learn to sleep wherever they can, whenever mm -hmm. they can. <laughs> and if you're having to multitask and be on a show and produce a show, y you end up doing the same thing with writing. You're writing on your feet, you're writing in the rooms, you're writing on the set. Uh, yeah, writing on the set, writing in the room, writing on my feet, uh, r pulling the computer out, sitting in the hall in the editing room while the editor does something, writing a page or something. I mean, it's, so for me, environment is just, it, I guess it's a mental environment or a mental state that I just have to put myself in and put those blinders on and look at the screen and, and work, you know? Right. Do you have a ritual that you go through when you start to write? I procrastinate as long as possible <laughs> until I'm really, really panicky, and then I uh, think about all the money I, I owe, and then I... So it's a standard writer answer. Yeah, basically. <laughs> uh, no, I don't really have a ritual. Uh, I, I like to have a little coffee first. Right. Uh, and then I, I usually answer my email. It takes take five hours if I really want to really mess around but but take a few minutes to answer my email and and read the news and then I, I get started but if but that's because I'm freelancing and I right. don't have phone calls and all this other stuff all over me so I, I have a little more time and I just know that if I get a certain amount of work done during the day it's fine I don't worry too much about when it gets done or all right that kind of stuff. Well, what makes a good writer I think it's it's someone who just loves to tell stories and loves to hear stories and, and, and is very interested in in all the convolutions of that in character and people. Uh, a very good observer, someone who who absorbs a lot of what they see in the world. You know, I think the stereotypical writer is the geek in the corner at the cocktail party, just sort of watching everybody. And I think that there's a certain amount of truth to that. <laughs> is that how you would describe yourself? Uh, as the geek in the corner at the mm -hmm. cocktail party, yeah, you know, I, I was certainly not uh, not the uh, the head of the cheerleading squad at my high school or anything like that. I mean, I was I was one of the the nerdy nerdier students. Um, Did you always want to be a writer? 
I, I was always interested in writing. I, I tried to write my first novel when I was in fifth grade. Uh, I did not really? finish it. Uh, I tried my second one when I was in eighth grade, and I did not finish it. I tried my third one when I was in college, and I did not finish it. And I'm working on my fourth one now, and I'm almost done. Um, <laughs> I may actually finish this one. Uh, so I was always trying to be a writer. I think I think uh, I read voraciously when I was a kid, and I, I always thought that it would be cool to be Robert Heinlein uh, of because course. he wrote all these great GV science fiction novels, which I read when I was in third, fourth, fifth grade. I read them all. Um, but uh, there was a time I wanted to be a, an astronaut, like all kids do. But my eyes are terrible, so I couldn't be. An well, but you ended up working in deep space anyway. So I sort of did. Yeah, I exactly. sort of got that. Uh, <laughs> Got to be on the promenade and, the, and on various space station bridges, but uh, space well, bridges. You've got to go on beyond just being a writer. You're also an executive producer. You've produced many series, and as such, what are some of the mistakes that you see being made by young writers coming up in the business now? Well, I think that there's a, a, a couple things. Uh, one is, and I read, I read a, a fair amount of sample specs or sample episodes of shows, but I, I read a fair amount of sample pilots right. sometimes. And I think one of the biggest mistakes people make is when they write a sample pilot, they don't think about what, the, what I call the engine of the show is. What's going to keep the show moving forward week to week and what's going to make people come in and watch it? That's not the same thing for every show. It can be something different for every show, but generally it means having a compelling central character that the audience is going to care about and want to see what happens to. And then furthermore, having some sort of interesting thing that's going to happen week to week. Now it may be, is Meredith going to get, finally land Shepard or vice versa? Right. I mean, that's a compelling engine for a show. It, it could be, is this, are these crazy women on this cul-de-sac going, going to be able to survive all the madness in their lives? Or it could be, hey, look at a really new way of looking at carpet fibers. I mean, it, it, doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be the same thing for every show. But generally, it's a character-based thing. A CSI is an exception because it's really the tech and the mechanism of it. Um, well, do you find that, that newer writers tend to focus more on trying to, to do the most interesting twist in a plot rather than focus on the characters themselves? Yeah. Yeah, I think that that's a common <clears throat> mistake is that... Is that uh, Beginning writers think that a clever idea is enough right. in a lot of ways, and that, and that if you throw enough twists and turns, even if they're not necessarily motivated twists and turns, you'll, you'll get the audience and they'll be fine. But it's the character to me, especially in television. You might be able to get away with two hours of a movie where really you don't give a crap about any of the people in it and they're miserable and, and at the end you never want to meet them again. And, but the convolutions of their story have been interesting, so you're there for two hours. Right. But in television, um, I can't remember who first said this to me, you, you have to invite these people into your home once a week. Right. Hopefully for five or six years or seven years. So there needs to be enough appeal that you want, even Tony Soprano, you know, the first time we see Tony Soprano, he's not whacking somebody. The first time we see Tony Soprano, he's grilling sausages and he's talking about what a crappy kid he's got and he, all his problems, and then he has a panic attack and he collapses in the middle of a picnic. That's how we meet him. We don't meet him blowing somebody's brains out. So there's a certain amount of identification. I mean, he's an aging guy with a gut and family problems first, right. and then he's a mobster. And so everybody who's in middle management in the suburbs can identify with Tony because they, they see some of the same problems. They've got people above them that are giving them crap. They've got people below them that are letting them down. And then they've got all these family things that they're having to deal with. That's a universal story, and that's why Sopranos you know, had an identifiable character that made you want to watch it. Well, and I, I hear this issue from writers that I talk to a lot when it really comes to television. It's relatability. You know, that's what brings audiences back. It's not a clever twist necessarily. It's, are the characters relatable? Do you see yourself or someone you know in them? Yeah. Or, or do you aspire to be them? Right. That can be true, too. I mean, I think that that was the case a lot of the time with the Star Trek characters. Do you aspire to be them? Do you wish you could be them? So you may not relate to them in their daily lives, but in, in your fantasy life, in your, in your hopes and dreams, you can relate to them. So there's an aspirational identification with the characters in, in uh, you know, especially in Next Generation, but also to a certain extent in Deep Space Nine. Less so in drama, I try to humanize people, the, the, the crew, a little bit more. But still, you know, the, it was still aspirational because they were running around on this big adventure. Right. Um, and they were trying to overcome their own personal idiosyncrasies. Idiosyncra idiosyncrasies? 
to do something. Yeah, yeah. yeah, their own idiosyncratic personalities to yeah. do something amazing. You know, and I think that that's that's something we all identify with too. The, this whole idea that we all want to be the heroes of our lives, but we're aware of our own failings. Can right. can we still manage to be heroic in the context of our daily lives, in spite of our own shortcomings? Sort of a classic hero mythology, and we'll talk about that a yeah. little bit a little later on as we go through this, because I know you, you've studied mythology quite a bit. Um, but I'm curious, which Star Trek character did you relate to the best? Um, it's interesting because I think when I was on Deep Space Nine, I identified the most with Bashir because he was my age. Right. Sid and I are basically the same age. He was uh, he was at his first job. He was a little awkward. He, Doctor Bashir. Doctor Bashir. Yeah, I'm not, I have no interest in medicine, but but uh, but he. he Personality-wise, I suppose, uh, that was the easiest character for me to identify with um, on, on, that, on that show. Right. Um, yeah. What motivates you as a writer? I, I just love telling stories. I love, I love that. I love the idea of coming up with a great character and a great situation and, and sort of laying out a story that hopefully moves people emotionally you know, uh, makes them intellectually excited. Um, I love all of that. I love watching stories. I love reading stories. I love telling stories. So it's all about that sort of primal. Let's sit around the campfire and and Robert tell us a story type type of thing. It's 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 a really fun thing. Well, what comes first for you when you're starting a new story? Is it character or is it plot? Uh, it's it's organic. I, I sometimes it's character sometimes it's plot sometimes it's an arena mm -hmm. uh, I just did a I did a feature spec about a there was a biblical historical that no one will ever make um, <laughs> but I just thought that the character was really interesting and right. the situation of the character was very very interesting and it was a new way to see a story everyone had heard a million times if you saw it through this character's point of view it was similar to um, my friend Hans and I wrote a story about the Aztec conquest Right. And the thing which we sold to Ron Howard and it didn't get made and hopefully someday. But but it was well received and the reason we what brought us into it was not the Aztec conquest but was the character that we we thought had the most interesting point of view on the Aztec conquest which was not Moctezuma, which was not Cortez, which was not Quatemec who's another guy that all the historians dig, but it was Cortez's Aztec mistress and translator that we thought was the most interesting character. Malinali, uh, also known as La Malinche, who's a widely reviled character in Mexican history. I mean, she's despised. Um, but she's really, really interesting. And ultimately, we, when, we under, when I heard the story of her from Hans, I said to him, that's a, that's a movie. You tell that, that woman's story, and you've got a movie. Um, and I was almost right. Uh, <laughs> well, typical Hollywood story, why don't you think it'll ever be made? Well, it may be made. I, I, I hope it will someday be made. Um, the, the, the history of it is that Ron Howard bought it, imagine. And, right. And, uh, and he was very enthusiastic, but, you know, he can only direct one movie every year or two. And when Russell Crowe said, hey, you know, I'd love to work with you again. Let's do Cinderella, man. And then some, you know, the studio, a uh, big studio said, hey, you want to direct the most popular book in the history of the world? You know, suddenly his attention was was pulled away. <laughs> and once you lose that attention, it's sometimes very difficult to get it back. So insight to behind the scenes how things really work yeah. here. So Cinderella Man gets made and Da Vinci Code gets made and now his Angels and Demons is getting made and and I can't who can blame him? I mean right. those are all great projects. And Frost Nixon was terrific. Yes, absolutely. Um, so Serpent the Serpent and the Eagle did not get made. We'll see though. Someday. You never know. They they you these, never know. these come back Years and years later, you yeah. never know. I mean, it's interesting because the Aztec conquest is a very cinematic and amazing story, and there's been many, many scripts written about it. Part of the problem is it's it's huge. It's, right. it's a gigantic, epic thing. You need, you know, you need literally do need the fifty thousand Aztec soldiers in all their plumage coming over the hill and to do it right, and you need right. to recreate. Uh, Tenochtitlan and old Mexico City and, and all that stuff. It's, it's a massive undertaking, but hopefully someday it'll get done. What are some of the biggest obstacles you have to overcome as a writer? My own inherent laziness, mostly. <laughs> uh, that, I mean, writing is hard. Writing is, is very, very hard work. I, I think can that that's something that people don't always understand. Even, even 
people who have decided that they're going to write and begin to write don't always understand the, the incredible amount of work. I mean, I was reading um, Outliers, the, the Malcolm uh, Gladwell book about, about successful people and cultures and things like that. And one of the things he talks about is that it takes 10,000 hours of work to get good at something. And uh, I, I suffer from the same misconception. When I sat down to start writing, I thought, I, I know how to, I can type. I can, you know, I can string words together. I know how to tell a story. And I, of course, I'll, I'll be great. I'll, I'll write this. I'll sell it. I'll make a bunch of money. It'll be awesome. Uh, and, and to make matters worse, the first script I, I wrote, I actually did win a, pr a prize, uh, and I won some right. money. So I made a profit on my first script. It was 1500 bucks. It was enough to buy my first computer. And I thought, hey, I can do this. And so it took, then five years later, I finally actually got my first paycheck. So, and, and, that, and over the course of those years, I wrote eight features. That's, you know, that's... 800 pages, you know, multiply that times how many rewrites. I'm, I'm sure I spent at least 5,000 hours writing. Are you good now? I'm, 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 I'm adequate. I'm, I'm good enough to get paid. Uh, I, think I'm, I think I'm pretty good. I don't know if I'm great. Um, hopefully someday I'll be great, but I think I'm good. So you have a five-year gap from uh, when you won that award to when you finally sold your first project? Yeah. A fistful of datas. Correct. Yeah, a fistful of datas. I... Um, that's uh, Star Trek: The Next Generation. Star Trek: episode. The Next Generation. Yeah, I was uh, represented by a writer, uh, represented by an agent who represented another writer on Next Generation, so they were able to get me into pitch. Um, and the first time I went into pitch, I sold nothing, but apparently I impressed Michael Pillar enough that he invited me back. Second time I came in, I sold nothing, right. but uh, somehow he still had some kind of faith in me. And the third time I came in, I sold. I came in with two ideas, only two ideas. One I was sure was going to sell, and then this junky thing called Fistful of Datas. And uh, at the time, it was called The Good, The Bad, and The Klingon. Uh, <laughs> That's and a great title. Uh, they were both good. Uh, and I, I, I pitched out the first one. I was really, really confident. I was sure they were going to buy it. And they really liked it, and I could tell they liked it. And then at the end, they said, we have something similar. And I was so frustrated. I literally... I was sitting at the edge of a couch, and I literally banged my head against the arm of the couch. And I said, all right, I got this other one. And I pitched the other one, and they were like, yeah, that's good. You know, it, it, <laughs> and that's not an unsimilar story either, because uh, I've been through the same thing. And, and years ago, I, I was pitching a producer a feature film and, and came in with an idea that I had completely worked out. I thought for sure it's a slam dunk. The guy liked it, wasn't too impressed, said, what else do you have? Made something up right on the spot. Yeah. They bought it. Yeah, sometimes, sometimes you just get a little lucky. But it's the persistence that makes you lucky. Because I, I, I only got lucky my third try. If I'd given up after the first right. time or the second time, if I hadn't done my homework, if I hadn't come prepared, if I hadn't taken it seriously, I wouldn't have been in the right place to kind of get lucky. Right. And so, yeah, I sold them Fistful of Datas on a pitch, uh, wrote the story, and then I got lucky again because uh, they just hired, I think, Renee or Brandon on the staff, one or the other. And they, they said, look, we've got these three stories. We need, you, you need to write something. Pick one. And he did not pick mine to write, which meant that they had to have me write it. <laughs> if Thanks. he'd picked mine, if he had liked Westerns a little better, I, I, who knows what would have happened. Opened up the door to the Star Trek world for right. you. So I wrote that draft. Uh, they liked it enough that they hired me to write a freelance Deep Space Nine before it even came on the air, and then they hired me on the staff. On so Space you're working on Deep Space Nine. I think uh, it was your first staff job. Yeah. And uh, you worked on it for several years. Five years. More than several. Yeah. Uh, what did working on staff on that show teach you about writing for your first, for your first staff job? I mean, everything. I mean, my, uh, you couldn't ask for better people to learn the business from than Michael Piller and Ira Bear. I mean, th these are two incredibly talented guys who really know their way around right. a writer's room, how to do story, character, all of that stuff. Th I had gone to graduate school in screenwriting. But being on Deep Space Nine was like a whole nother, you know, it was like my residence. It's like going to school all over again. It was like going to school all over again. And, and we were breaking story two, three days a week. We were taking pitches two days, three days a week. We, we wrote a tremendous amount. There were only five people on staff on that show, and we did 26 episodes a year. That's a lot. I, I wrote or co-wrote in five years 40 episodes of that show, I think. Wow. 30-something, easily 30-something. So, I mean, that's... That's a huge amount of work, a huge amount of figuring things out. Not all of them were great. Some of them were very good, I'd like to think. At least one of them was atrociously bad. Uh, but, 
But again, it was a learning thing, and it, and it was great fun, and the money was good, and the guys were great. We had a terrific staff. Um, well, and, and you mentioned Stephen and uh, and uh, Renee, and, Ira and uh, Renee. yeah, I yeah, mean, Ira Bear, Renee Echeverria, Ron Moore, uh, uh, Hans Bymore. I mean, what is it about Star Trek that so many of the writers have gone on to such great success? It's hard to write. <laughs> you have to actually be good to write it. I mean, I'm not saying this to like put laurels on myself. I'm just saying that, first of all, we did 26 a year. Right. Nowadays, 22 is a lot. We only we had small staffs, five, six people on a staff. Nowadays, staffs, well, they're getting smaller again, but a lot of uh, network shows have eight or ten writers on a staff. Uh, we worked together every day as a group, so we were constantly talking story, working story. On a lot of shows, you're lucky to write one script, maybe two right. scripts, and, and you don't even come into the office. You go, they send you home, and you're barely around the other writers. It was really a, a, a sort of a boot camp in writing on that show. And, and it is a difficult, it's a difficult, it was a difficult show to write. You had to in, integrate adventure, tech, sci-fi, weirdness, good character stuff. So it was, it was a, I think it did really, really train people to how to, how to do a good job. Were you satisfied with the way that series ended after seven years? Uh, I wasn't on it in the last two years. so You must have seen it. I saw it, yeah. I mean, I, I liked it. I, I saw a lot of what they were doing. But honestly, I was so busy working on my own stuff at the time, I was barely paying attention. It's, it's difficult for me to watch a show that I've worked on once I've left because I'm constantly second-guessing what they're doing. And so it's not a pleasurable experience. I hear this from a lot of writers, actually, right. in television. Once they leave a show, they never watch it again. I did watch Deep Space Nine. I thought they did some nice stuff. But they offered me, I did a freelance for them in the seventh season, and they offered me one of the episodes in the final arc to write as a freelancer. Oh. And I turned it down because I said, basically, I just don't, I'm not in it enough. Right. I'm, not, I'm not immersed enough in what you're doing to, to really be able to deliver something that you guys are going to be able to use. And I don't want to do that. I don't want to waste your time. So. What, did you, what did you think of the, uh, the sequels that came after that, Voyager and Enterprise? Did you watch those? Didn't watch them. Again, I mean, I watched maybe an episode here or there, but again, it's very, very difficult having been so intensely involved in that franchise for five years. I mean, it was all consuming for five years. Right. If I sit down and watch an episode, or, or at least especially then, right after I got done. If I sat down and watched an episode, I was constantly thinking, why, I wouldn't do that, I wouldn't do it that way, or, and that's no, that's no fun. I'd rather watch something I had nothing to do with. <laughs> I'm gonna hit you with a quote. Yeah. An observer changes what's observed. Yes. How does that apply to writing for you? Um, I think that I mean, a writer certainly changes what they write about in a weird, especially when you do something that has any kind of basis in history. You reframe the way people think about what actually happened. Um, writing is a is a is a an active thing. You're you're jumping in and you're stepping all over everything. If you adapt a book, I don't care how faithful you are, you're changing the perception of that book. Right. Um, and you you are making decisions, even if you're pretending you're not. You you are going to take some things out. There are Tom Bombadil is not going to show up, and that's going to piss some people off. <laughs> um, so you are sort of reshaping anything you put your grubby little paws on. By the time it comes out of your your end of the typewriter, or if you're rewriting another writer, I mean uh, it, it's inevitable that you're entangling yourself in the in the material. Right. And you know you can't help but change it. How much of Andromeda had Gene Roddenberry mapped out? Uh, not much. Not very much. Did you have more than just the title? Um, there was going to be a sentient spaceship and a civil, and then he did a different, he had one project he'd written a treatment about two pages long about a sentient spaceship going out and having adventures with a crew. He wrote another treatment totally different about civilization falling, a guy who was locked in time, waking up from the old civilization and trying to put it back together again. That was it. That's, oh, and there was a one character, sort of, uh, sort of a genetically engineered superhuman from another project. What I got was like a stack of notes this thick right. of different things he developed and philosophical things and all that other stuff. And then I, and they wanted a starship. They knew that. 
What was it? Was it based on that one idea, or were there many ideas in that? There stuff? were several ideas in there. There was a lot of stuff on what the the idea of the guy coming back and saving and putting civilization back together, which was a set on Earth. There was a guy walking. Right. It was not. There was no starship involved. But the ideas, the philosophy, the sort of the importance of civilization, what we would miss if civilization fell, all that kind of stuff was in there. And then the starship thing was very, very thin. But I was assigned to do a starship show. So. Well, and Ruddenberry, I think, it, particularly Star Trek, you know, had a big impact because of the philosophy that the show brought. Right. And uh, it sounds like you sort of picked up on some of that with Andromeda and, and then worked it into your own project at that point. Yeah. Uh, basically, that what I did was I, I really wanted to say that trying to make things better is a good thing, that civilization is good. Mm -hmm. We would miss it if it were gone. <laughs> uh, and this was something that, that, I mean, there are a lot of, this was before Jericho and before Lost. Um, but this idea that if the world collapsed, you know, there's a certain fantasy that if civilization collapsed, I'd be okay, I'd get my, you know, club and I'd go out and I'd be all right, you know. And the truth is that most of us would totally fail. Right. Um, <laughs> and we would miss it. You know, there's a lot of things that we'd miss. So I was trying to capture some of that. Was it a natural progression for you to move from Star Trek Deep Space Nine over to Gene Roddenberry's Andromeda? Um, I, I think that that's why they hired me. They thought it was going to be a natural progression. Uh, I had done some other things in there. I'd written a feature that didn't get made. I'd done a backdoor pilot that got shot that never got picked up the series. Um, and I just liked the idea. The good thing about Deep Space Nine, coming from Deep Space Nine to Andromeda, was I hadn't done a spaceship show. We'd done a space station That's show, true. which is a different thing. Right. So I hadn't really done that boldly go to a new place every week, have an adventure, fly away thing. And uh, there's a different dynamic to that. Well, it could, leads me to my next question then. Um, how does Captain Benjamin Sisko differ from Captain Dylan Hunt? Um, Sisko's more responsible in a weird way. Cisco is more grounded in reality. They're both crazier than, they're both bat crazy, but. Uh, Probably have to be to be a captain yeah, in deep well, space. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah. Um, but but uh, Cisco's a builder. Cisco's a guy who, who ran uh, an engineering program to build a starship. He, he wanted to build himself a house. He built that crazy sail ship for, for him and his kid. He's a builder, he's a guy who, takes the time and the effort to meticulously put things together and you know he's a little bit of an architect he he was a guy who always had to think about long-term consequences right. Dylan Hunt was a big idea guy he was sort of a he was much more chaotic he was much more Don Quixote the, the thing that Dylan was trying to do was much crazier than what Benjamin was trying to do Sis, what Cisco was trying to do was just get one planet out of a bad situation and into the Federation it was literally, uh, uh, now a lot of other things sort of distracted him from that, but that was his plan. Uh, Dylan Hunt was trying to rebuild an entire civilization and one that was thousands of times bigger than the Federation. <laughs> so he was crazy. Which was more fun to write? They were both a lot of fun. I mean, I, I don't want to do something that's not. Right. I mean, it, you can't do something for five years if it's not fun. You can't create a show. If you create a show and it's not fun, you're doing it wrong. It better be fun for you. Because if it's not fun for you, it won't be fun for the audience. So they were both really fun. Do you get writer's block? Um, I get lazy. Uh, Is that the same thing? No. no. Uh, I think if I'm getting paid, I never have writer's block. OK. <laughs> You're not allowed to. Because uh, I'm not allowed to. What's the best piece of advice you ever received as a writer? Uh, don't buy a boat. <laughs> I'm not even going to ask how that relates to writing. <laughs> uh, I'll tell you how it relates to writing. All right, go writing. ahead. Um, and it, 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 I'm joking. That was actually a, a, uh, it's a James Garner story. Uh, oh, really? When he was uh, playing Rockford, this young actor came to him and said, what's the single best piece of advice you can give me as an actor? And Garner turned to him and said, don't buy a blank expletive deleted boat. <laughs> um, because writing in Hollywood is a sporadic, it's a, it's a, the income goes like this. Right. So if you spend like you're here, like you spend like your good years are going to last forever, you go out and buy the boat and the big house and all that other crap and the Jaguar, you know, you're going to be in for a nasty shock when your show get canceled. Gets Boy, canceled. there's an in reference. Don't buy a boat. <laughs> 
Um, I mean, yeah, but it is. The truth is that there's two parts to being a writer in Hollywood. There's the actual craft, and then there's the handling yourself professionally, right. and financially, navigating that. And in order to have longevity, you have to be good at both. What was your contribution to the 4400? Um, I was hired on, uh, Scott had written, Scott Peters had written um, the two-hour pilot movie. Right. Um, and Ira, Renee and then Ira sequentially were hired to help him. And then when it was decided it was going to be a six-hour miniseries, I came in as a consulting producer. And uh, Ira and I together helped Scott and because uh, uh, Scott had never run a show before. And um, we also had brought in Craig Sweeney. That was his first job. He's on Medium now. And the four of us broke the miniseries. We rebroke. We had to rebreak the two-hour because once we knew what the miniseries was going to be, the two-hour no longer completely fit, and we had to change a lot of things. Right. So we rebroke that. Uh, I did a lot of rewriting on those with Ira. I mean, Ira basically. Right. It was really Ira's baby. Uh, by the end of it all, but but we did a lot of rewriting. I mean, uh, Scott was involved and Craig was there the whole time too. And Do you find it's different writing for an ensemble cast like the Forty Four Hundred as opposed to Star Trek: Deep Space Nine? Well, that was a huge ensemble cast too. Right. I Those mean, is there a difference when it comes to writing for ensemble cast? Not really? No. I mean, uh, in both cases, you usually have a lead uh, who's the center of everything, and you make the stories all kind of come back to them. But then it's it's all about balancing the characters. Uh, 4400 was more serialized than Deep Space Nine, so right. there, was, there were more threads that would run over multiple episodes. But, but anyway, so what I, what I did was I helped shape that first six hours, then I left. Right. And then I actually ended up coming back for the last uh, ten episodes or so. I, I only worked on it for ten weeks. I came back to help them break the last. Frustrating that they don't allow something like that to have a proper ending? Yeah, uh, more frustrating for Craig and Scott and, and Ira than for me because yeah. they really sweat blood over that show for four years. Um, for me, it was great because I just loved the, all those guys and it was great to great fun to work with them again. It was great to work with them at the beginning and it was great to come back and work with it at the end. But yeah, it's frustrating. I think that you know the ending that they got on 4400, you can see the end right. from where they were. You, know? uh, you could see where it was going to go in a year probably. Um, but it wasn't there yet, yeah. and it would have been nice to be able to go another 10 episodes and really wrap it up, but that's a luxury. You don't right. always get that. What is it about writing that you can't learn? You either have it or you don't. I'm not sure that there is anything about writing that you can't learn. I'm not a guy who thinks that only people touched by genius can do it. I, the thing that you need to learn is how hard how you have to focus you have to right. be willing to work your ass off um, I think that's true of anything yeah. that you want to be good at but but writing is is very tough uh, I think that I suppose if you don't love story if you're not a person who reads a lot of fiction if you're not a person who likes to tell stories or isn't interested in people then you're probably not cut out to be a writer but if you if you have those things and you you can write decent prose and, and you work for 10 years at it you could you, you, you can probably end up being a writer we touched on this earlier you've done a, a lot of research in comparative mythologies mm -hmm. and that's important particularly for uh, some of the projects you've worked on mm -hmm. but how has that influenced you as a writer I think that it helps to know the stories that people told before there's a certain university out Universality. 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 Can't freaking talk today. That's okay. Live. Uh, From the writer's store. We'll fix it in editing. No, we won't. Um, <laughs> and so if you know what stories have been told throughout human history, you know what kind of characters uh, have been talked about, you know what interests people, I think it just it helps you when you sit down to write yourself. And it's not just mythology. It's Shakespeare or Dante or right. whatever else. Well, it goes back to the issue of relatability. Right, right. And, and there are stories that have lasted for, in some cases, 4,000, 5,000 years. Sure. And there's a reason those stories last. They have something to say that the, the, about the human condition that people respond to. And sometimes they're dramatic, and sometimes they're, they're mystical, and sometimes they're, they're funny. I mean, there's 
you know, the story of, of uh, Thor and Loki going fishing <laughs> is still the best, one of the best fish stories of all time. It's freaking hilarious. I can do, I can, I did it as a performance piece once. Really? It's I a, wish we had the time yeah, we had no, to do it here, yeah. It. Take me through the process of adapting a, a, the Dresden Files from a series of books to a television series. That was Hans and I working together. Um, we got approached, the books were there. They, they, they said, what do you think? We read uh, the first book. And we might have read two or three others. And we sat th with those, we said, we, we like this. We want to preserve as much as we can. Then the rubber hits the road, and you have to make the hard decisions about what you really can keep and what you can't. And sometimes right. it's about shooting practicalities. Sometimes it's about budget. Sometimes it's about network taste because they don't like something. And you, if, you, if the choice is get rid of it or don't do the show, you're, you should probably get rid of it. <laughs> Unless you really believe. But... but um, so there's a sort of a, it's like navigating a little bit of a maze. You right. know, you, 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 you know where you started, you know hopefully where you want to end up, and then you take a lot of, it's a very organic, again, it's an organic process. You do a lot of, you make a lot of decisions along the way. So with Dresden Files, we knew we wanted him to be a, a wizard who was listed in the Chicago Yellow Pages, who had his name on the door of his storefront, and it said Harry Dresden Wizard. We knew... That, that, and that defines the character to a certain amount. That's a, a sort of cocky guy who doesn't give a crap what people think about him and is probably, you know, uh, tougher than you might think, but, but also weirdly insecure. And so we sort of worked from that. And Jim had a, created a great voice for that character in the books. Um, and then we sort of built from there. Right. Um, and we used as much as we could from the books because we really did like the books. Uh, they're... They're different from the series. The series was more of a rumpled detective story, and the books are a little bit more. Um, at one point, Jim called the first book semi-automatic, so so it's a, it's a little bit more of a action. They're, the books are more action. A lot more stuff happens in the books, and things explode a lot more. Uh, but you know, he can afford that. <laughs> what legacy would you like to leave behind as a writer? I'd like you to have to page down several times on my IMDb page. <laughs> Do you have a favorite line from a TV show or a movie? Do I have a favorite line from a TV show or a movie? Uh, like every line in Casablanca is great. I, I can't think of one right now off the top of my head. My favorite line in my favorite line that I, I use as my SIG on one of my uh, on one of the websites I go to right now is a real line that was actually said by. By Obama, and as he was giving an interview, uh, someone asked him about whether baggy pants should be against the law, and he, he went on about how they shouldn't be. And then my favorite little piece of dialogue is at the end. He said, "Having said that, brothers should pull up their pants." Because <laughs> 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 he said, "No, it shouldn't be illegal. That's ridiculous." But brothers should pull up their pants. I don't know. I just thought that was a good line. That's a good line. I also like. I also like. There was a, another quote. It was the reviewer of the Onion. He was reviewing. Uh, Chinese democracy, and he said something to the extent of reviewing Chinese democracy is very much like reviewing a unicorn. Should you praise it merely for existing, or do you try to review it as, a, as an unusual horse? I mean, you know, it was, it was anyway. Do you have any words of wisdom for aspiring writers? Ah, uh, write every day. I know everyone says that. I, it's the most boring thing that any writer ever says when someone asks them how to be a writer. But, but if you really want to be a writer, try to write five to ten pages a day, five days a week. And no, no easy task. No, but or at least sit there in front of the computer, staring at it, thinking about writing five pages a day, because that's writing too. Right. Like staring at a blank screen is actually writing, as long as you're not playing Minesweeper. Maybe even if you're playing Minesweeper, <laughs> but you can't be playing World of Warcraft because that's much more involving. It needs to be something stupid like Free Cell. Um, <laughs> that's all writing. As long as you're thinking about writing, your brain's kind of like flowing with ideas. That's writing. Uh, and, and read a lot. If you had to put a tagline on your career, like we so often have to do with our scripts, what would the tagline be for Robert Hewitt Wolf? Robert did not suck. <laughs> no, I, I don't uh, No, nope, Robert did not suck. Robert that worked. Suck. There we go. Robert was not boring. That's even better. That's the only, that's the other, that's the only cardinal sin in writing. The I, only cardinal sin in writing is thou shalt not be boring. If you're boring, I don't care what you do as long as you're not boring. Well, you so hopefully been, I was never boring. No, you haven't been boring here today. We appreciate you taking the time. <laughs> and we're going to take some questions from the audience. Hello, audience. 